Save it, save it. Well, it's wonderful to have this warm welcome in Los Angeles. I'm very touched. I thought that uh, my celebration of this e wonderful evening would be to read you poems that I've never read to an audience before because they're new, poems which have not been published. I'm not going to read a great many, especially as, as uh, time is leaking away from us this evening, but I, I, I will talk a little bit about each one. As some of you may know, I was very ill last year, and it was, I, so some of these poems were written before that, and a very few of them after it. It was the hardest thing for me during those months w was when I couldn't write poetry, and therefore I couldn't play records, because playing records made me so unhappy that I would just cry, because there was no, no poetry. That, that part of me just wasn't there after the stroke. For, for some time. So now I take, it's joyful for me to be back with poetry and to be here and to be reading new poems to you. The Skilled Man for Bill Vaughan. If someone should ask me how a poem is whittled and willed, just how it is done, you know, with what love, both wary and skilled, I'd suggest that he watch Bill make a thing that does not look hard, like this staff for an old knife, and learn that all that it takes to make a knife new or a word is the subtle exchange of a life. Down in Tennessee, where I have dear friends and go now and then, um, there's a woman whom I don't know very well, who has sheep and lambs. And the last time I was there, no, it wasn't the last, never mind, uh, two years ago when I was there. <laughs> uh, she appeared when we came to lunch with a, with a cosset lamb in her arms. I didn't know what a cosset lamb was, and some of you may not know. It's the title of the poem. A cosset lamb is a lamb who has been attacked by another animal so that the mother rejects it. This, this lamb had been attacked by a dog, and so it, it had to be brought up in the house like a pet, and she was carrying it. The Cosset Lamb. I met the Cosset Lamb carried in human arms because dog mauled, her mother would not nurse her, and bars in desolation along the fence. I met the lamb and was stunned by this innocence. What is there whiter, not milk or even blood root? What is there softer, not even a fresh snow? What is there sweeter than horizontal ears and strange blank eyes? There came a poignant calm, then that faint bar that lingers on. I knew I was in paradise. For all that is so dear and may be mauled, for terror and despair and for help near, I weep, I am undone. For all that can be healed, the cosset lamb you hold, and what cannot be healed, the mother in the field, I pray, now I'm alone. Thank you, but I would, I, I would, I love that, but at the same time, if you start applauding at one poem, you're going to feel guilty if you don't <laughs> applaud at the next. And it, 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 so it's sort of a difficult situation. So save the applause for the end. <laughs> this one, uh, I think, is, it needs a lot of work still. Some poems, you know, e lyric poems especially, perhaps, uh, go through, for me, a hundred drafts. Uh, this one, I've been trying to do for a long time, and uh, it was one of the things that I felt most miserable about, that I couldn't do it. Every day I go and get the mail about four miles, I mean I drive to the post office, and uh, I pass a beautiful river, the York River, and, and uh, salt marshes, and right along there, there, there is a little group of two geese and four ducks, and it has been sort of a marvelous joy to me to see these every day. And this is what the poem is about. After long illness, two geese, four ducks along the shore. They are the sight I always look for crossing the causeway on my way to town. 
They are exotic geese, each with a crest. The ducks, two mallard and two white. Sometimes the ducks are upside down, rumps up, beaks nibbling for fodder. Sometimes the geese are preening feather. But always what I hope for most is when they swim in a single line, floating the tide, always together, clearly connected in their varied skein. This is the sight I love the best. But whatever they do, and wherever they are, in whatever brilliant or gloomy weather, they rinse my eyes on the way to town. What, after all, brings joyful release after long illness, after near despair, better than four ducks and two geese? So if by chance they are not there, I am cross in the empty of joy air and feel deprived and suddenly alone, driving too fast now, cold at the bone. Some years ago, we had a really bad storm and an enormous tree right behind the house, an enormous white pine fell in it. Absence. It was always there the great white pine, shelter and solid comfort. From the second floor, I could watch red squirrels play, nuthatches lead their compulsive lives in its ample branches. From the third floor, I could turn away from the glittering ocean and rest my eyes on the thick, soft green. In all seasons, wind murmured through it. It was always present. We lived along together. Until a winter hurricane brought it shuddering down against the house, until that quiet strength was broken by force. On the second floor, the windows are empty, and here on the third, ragged firs and formless bits of sky are only an irritation. The air is silent. Must we lose what we love to know how much we loved it? It is always there now, that absence, that awful absence. Now here's one. <laughs> I'm bringing you New England now. <laughs> it's called Blizzard. But I believe, I believe that you do grow daffodils, but it, it, they never could be as precious here as they are when I look out on my field, as I did when I wrote this poem, and know that they will be back. Blizzard. Hard to imagine daffodils where I see nothing but white veils, incessant falling of thick snow in this nowhere, non-landscape which has no shadow and no shape and holds me fast and holds me deep and will not cease before I sleep. Hard to imagine somewhere else where life could stir and has a pulse and know that somewhere else will be this very field changed utterly with hosts of daffodils to show that spring was there under the snow New Englanders are skeptical of what cannot depend on will, yet I should know that this wide range of white and green and constant change have kept me kindled on the edge of fear, traveling the weather like a mountaineer. What is it that makes a boom every now? It may be the uh, part of the machinery here, I don't know. Every now and then there's sort of a thud. Here's a real autobiographical poem. Which some of you may know what, what it's about because there, uh, in my last book, Letters from Maine, there are a series of uh, poems called Letters from Maine, actually, but about the muse. I've always written poems for women. Women have been the inspiration behind them. And very late in my life, you see, I'm nearly 75 now, a muse actually turned up, but she turned out to be a failure. And this is... <laughs> This is about that. <laughs> After a visit, 
Who could have dreamed this house would prove to be so fragile under stress, containing, as it does, a created world? And so much pain here has been transcended. Who could have dreamed the crack in the walls? The shelf of my books in the library tells me I'm almost home free, almost that something real has been made here in this house and goes out into the world to say to others, as I say to my old dog, hesitating at the stairs, you can make it. The people who come here are my people, and every stranger welcomed as a friend to talk of herself or himself, to share what is most human. Even the front door is windowed. Nothing here says no. How could I know that the muse herself, the long-awaited, would put all this in peril? But when she entered, nothing moved. We were all frozen in polite attitudes. The tender words died in our dry mouths. No one could breathe the suffocating air. The bear went into mourning. The rabbit's ears flopped down. The parrot fell off his perch. Even the flowers, the fruit, looked dejected. So the muse came, and after 48 strange and damaging hours, the muse left. Soon I must open all the windows and go down to the sea with my dog to listen to its long, subtle variations on the theme of change, change and loss. But when I come home, I must begin to build back nerves House, we can make it. There may be a crack in our walls, but we are the same, or almost the same as we have always been, keeping soul alive, keeping ourselves warm in the high wind, someday recreating the poetry of absence where even the darkest darkness may flow in time, in time, in our own good time. I must have a sip of water. <coughs> it's the smog, you know, that's got me down. <laughs> Terribly dry throat. August 3rd, my mother's birthday. These days, lifting myself up like a heavy weight, old camel getting to her knees, I think of my mother and the inexhaustible flame that kept her alive until she died. She knew all about fatigue and how one pushes it aside for staking up the lilies early in the morning, the way one pushes it aside for a friend in need, for a hungry cat. Mother, be with me. Today, on your birthday, I'm older than you were when you died 35 years ago. Thinking of you, the old camel gets to her knees, stands up, moves forward slowly into the new day. If you taught me one thing, it was never to fail life. Destinations. Actually, this is an old poem. It's never been published that I'd forgotten all about, and somebody reminded me of it. Uh, uh, and it was some, I have a wonderful secretary now who knows where everything is. So I said, could you possibly find a poem called Dedications? And there she was with it, you know, in five minutes. Marvelous. <laughs> Destinations. Every day we meet these bodies on the road the torn up porcupines like tanks exploded, the battered cats, dogs, raccoons dead. Every road we take is normally bloodied. Bodies the usual, like thrown out beer cans or cars abandoned in the fields to rust. Only these animals never were machines. It hurts to think of so much living lost of where they wanted to go and never got to, of the brute man who killed them for no reason, simply because he saw no reason not to, and kills on every day, in every season, 
and will not look at what he is doing to love himself or the starving nations. Slow down and think. Consider destinations. Destructive man, poor rat, just keeps on going. What is that noise? Can anybody tell me? Excuse me, what? It's the, it's the mic. OK, so nothing can be done. All right. AIDS. We are stretched to meet a new dimension of love, a more demanding range where despair and hope must intertwine. How grow to meet it? Intention here can neither move nor change the raw truth. Death is on the line. It comes to separate and estrange lover from lover in some reckless design. Where do we go from here? Fear, 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 fear. Our world has never been more stark or more in peril. It is very lonely now in the dark, lonely and sterile. And yet, in the simple turn of a head, mercy lives. I heard it when someone said, I must go now to a dying friend. Every night at nine, I tuck him into bed and give him a shot of morphine and added, I go where I have never been. I saw he meant into a new discipline he had not imagined before, and a new grace. Every day now we meet it face to face. Every day now, devotion is the test. Through the long hours, the hard, caring nights, we are forging a new union. We are blessed. As closed hands open to each other, Closed lives open to strange tenderness. We are learning the hard way how to mother. Who says it's easy? But we have the power. I watch the faces deepen all around me. It is the time of change, the saving hour. The word is not fear, the word we live, but an old word suddenly made new as we learn it again, as we bring it alive. Love, 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 love. Thank you. I read that in, in Boston at a big dinner where we raised, raised a lot of money. And it was a wonderful evening. And I heard so many stories like that of the man who excused himself to go to his friend. Well, now we're, I'm moving out into something else. Uh, somebody sent me a postcard of a smiling angel in a painting by Stefano Sassetta. <coughs> and it was so different from other angels that, of the period. I really don't know the exact dates of Sassetta. I should have. I should have looked him up, but my guess is 16th century. The smile. Angels are grave if they exist at all, lifted above the gritty frustration, the lonely spendthrift way we live. They wing it upwards where we stumble, space, air, and light, their habitation, distance their message beyond love. But here the painter dreamed a different kind, an angel of the earth, secretly smiling. She listens with a plain, astonished face, full of delight at what her fingers find to music which she hears as so beguiling, herself, her lute, become amazing grace. And I am suddenly transported here into the always saving joy and thrust of pure creation, seized by the hair, the shock of this, of this angel's atmosphere, and thrown up to the sky in a wild gust that blows to pieces anger and despair. 
All kinds of terrible things happened last year. I lost both my cat and my dog, each 14 years old. And in the middle of one night, a, a high wind, either a high wind or a deer, blew down a, a work of art that I'd commissioned some years ago of Persephone rising from the ocean. And so it just cracked. And it was a tremendous shock. I mean, we deal with death of people and animals all the time. Uh, but very rarely, and in fact never perhaps, have I had to deal with the death of a work of art. Persephone here rose from the ocean. Her rebirth did not stem from Pluto's caves, but from deep under curling waves. So I had dreamed her, and the sculptor carved it, and placed her in eternal motion. There on the terrace wall, she rose to be questioned and contemplated. In changing light, the myth newly related, I knew she would stay there in mystery, the work of art, to live when all else goes. But then it happened, awesome blow. Leap of a frightened deer or raging wind tore from the wall and overturned Persephone to be forever there and she was shattered on the ground below. And so I met a death without blood, death of a work of art that reverses future to past and so curses our hope and faith in what could have stayed after we all are gone, ultimate good. It's not Persephone I mourn today. It is our delicate and fragile way with rock or word with paint or note, what we have made that takes me by the throat. Death of a dream, death of a work of art. I had not faced this death before or known this hurt. This poem I wrote, the next one, I wrote before Bramble, my darling cat, died. And she appears at the end of it. I now, I, must t I do have another cat, um, so that there is somebody who still comes softly up the stairs as I tell it in the poem. This is a poem about where I am now as a woman of, of uh, 75 in, a, in, a, in two weeks. Um, that is, and a woman who's had a stroke who has therefore really faced growing old, perhaps, for the first time, and what it means. And I was trying to, to, that's what poetry is for me, the way of finding out where I am. The silence now. These days, the silence is immense. It is there deep down, not to be escaped. The twittering flight of goldfinches, the three crows cawing in the distance, only brush the surface of this silence, full of mourning, the long drawn out tug and sigh of waters never still, the ocean out there and the inner ocean. Only animals comfort because they live in the present and cannot drag us down into those caverns of memory full of loss. They pay no attention to the thunder of distant waves. My dog's eager eyes watch me as I sit by the window, thinking. At the bottom of the silence, what lies in wait? Is it love? Is it death? Too early or too late? What is it I can have that I still want? My swift response is to what cannot stay. The dying daffodils, peonies on the way, iris just opening, lilac turning brown, in the immense silence where I live alone. It is the transient that touches me old, those light shot clouds as the sky clears, a passing glory can still move to tears, moments of pure joy, like some fairy gold, too evanescent to be kept or told. And the cat's Soft footfall on the stair keeps me alive, makes nowhere into here. 
At the bottom of the silence, it is she who speaks of an eternal now to me. And of course, growing old and also getting well after a long illness is a matter of living in the eternal now. I mean, it really is sort of the mystics, eter the mystics now. And I think I've learned, I learned something about it by uh, going through what I did. Well, we always learn something out of everything. And of course, that's the wonderful thing about being a poet. You can use everything, even the worst things. <laughs> and you have to. Christmas light. One of the things that happened at the end of um, 86, 85, I guess it was, just before I had the stroke, the Christmas tree, which was always very big in my house up to the ceiling, burned down and the house would have gone with it if I hadn't managed to put it out with a, with a fire extinguisher. And it was the most terrifying thing I've ever been through. When the fire department finally came, they couldn't believe I'd put it out. And I'm now really famous in the village. I never was. <laughs> I never was as a writer, you see. But because I put out the fire. <clears throat> well, last Christmas, I had a very small tree, only about this high. <laughs> This is going to be my Christmas poem uh, this coming year. Christmas Light. When everyone had gone, I sat in the library with the small, silent tree, she and I alone. How softly she shone. And for the first time then, for the first time this year, I felt newborn again. I felt love's presence near. Love distant, love detached, and strangely without weight, was with me in the night when everyone had gone, and the garland of pure light stayed on, stayed on. And finally, a poem which is not new, but again, one of these discoveries. Uh, I came upon it looking for something else the other day, and I was so delighted because I had thought that it was no good. And now I think it is, and <laughs> partly, partly because of what I've been through. Partly because I sent it to a 90-year-old friend of mine in London, Lady Huxley, who just celebrated her 90th birthday, and she said, it's such a comforting poem, don't change a word. The Phoenix Again. On the ashes of this nest, love wove with deathly fire, the phoenix takes its rest, forgetting all desire. After the flame, a pause. After the pain, rebirth. Obeying nature's laws, the phoenix goes to earth. You cannot call it old, you cannot call it young. No phoenix can be told this is the end of song. It struggles now alone against death and self-doubt. But underneath the bone, the wings are pushing out. And one cold, starry night, whatever your belief, the phoenix will take flight over the seas of grief to sing his thrilling song to stars and waves and sky. For neither old nor young, the phoenix does not die. And that's it. Thank you.